Phoenix is going to be hosted by Courtney O'Donnell and I4, who will take it away and do the introductions. Courtney. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Courtney O'Donnell. I'm one of the University of Washington uh, R4s, and I'll be introducing our speakers as well as some questions that I hope you can all think about during the presentation that I myself had uh, in learning about this topic. Musculoskeletal conditions are a major burden on individuals, health systems, and social care systems, with indirect costs being predominant. This burden has been recognized by both the United Nations as well as the World Health Organization. We're very lucky to have three uh, unique speakers here with us today. Uh, King Holmes is the chair of our Global Health Department at the University of Washington, as well as the director for uh, the University of Washington Center for AIDS and STD Research, which is a WHO collaborating center. He has done a tremendous amount of work, both globally and internationally, on STI prevention, as well as HIV research um, in Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, and the Western Pacific. We also have Theo Voss here with us today, who is a professor of global health at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, and a key part of the global burden of disease research team. Dr. Wagner is very well known to us, and he'll be our last speaker uh, from both orthopedics and neurological surgery. Uh, he's done a tremendous amount of work, both locally and globally. So I'd like to introduce our topic with a few questions that I have and I, I hope will simulate some discussion at the end of the session. What is the definition of the global burden of disease? How did the University of Washington Department of Global Health come to be established? What is a disability-adjusted life year? How does one collect data points to understand the burden of disease and disability adjusted life years? As an orthopedic resident or physician, do I need to investigate internationally to understand the global burden of disease? Is there an opportunity for an international experience to research the global burden of disease and provide clinical service? How many of our residents would be interested in an international experience where there is a large burden of disease? How many U.S. training programs offer such a rotation? So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Holmes, our chair of the Global Health Department. Thank you very much, Courtney. Um, this is the Feige building, and when uh, this building was opened, Jimmy Carter came to celebrate it, and uh, Bill Feige was here, and he said, people who are coming to this building are working here. The toughest thing that we're going to have to learn about working here is how to pronounce the name of the building. And uh, Ted threatened to introduce me as the foggy uh, professor or chairman of, people call it fe uh, fo foggy, uh, faggy, um, but it's fee, so it's nice to be here. And uh, I thought I would begin uh, just uh, trying to give you a little bit of a uh, definition of uh, what global health is. And uh, it was <coughs> used to be called uh, tropical medicine, and as times have gone on, it gradually evolved to geographic medicine, and the Rockefeller University was funding it, and then international medicine, and then international health, to not just be talking about medicine, but public health and other areas, and then global health, and we adopted the name global health for the department rather than international health. I want to do a strategic planning because this had five syllables and this just had two syllables. And I think that eventually we may be seeing world health will go from three syllables, I should say, to two syllables. And that's partly why we're using those terms. I think the concept, though, is that uh, global means we're dealing with conditions that affect all of us globally uh, across the world, things like climate change. So whereas international tend to mean going overseas to deal with the problems in other countries. So it's really a field, not a discipline. And the goal of the field is to try to bring people from all disciplines, like orthopedics, into global health to work effectively. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit about uh, the consortium of universities for global health that are now 
It's an organization that was actually pulled together by Haile DeVos, a surgeon from, used to be up here, now down, down at USCSF. And we have uh, been steadily growing. We first met about eight of us in, uh, eight years ago. And now the organization has grown and steadily growing to 120 schools domestically and inter internationally. These are global universities. You probably see the ones uh, where you went to school on this list, and it continues to increase. Uh, the actual uh, chair of the uh, CUGH now is Judy Wasserheit, who's vice chairman of our department. And we've had a lot to do with its organization. Um, so why is there this uh, tremendous interest in global health? And let's see how this works. Uh, partly, it's the sense, the growing sense of the wider income gap in the large health care. And then uh, now our governments are recognizing health and development issues. So USCID money is going to this. And there is the fear of the threat of global infectious disease pandemics. So, uh, SARS, the current problem uh, in uh, the Middle East, the something like MERS, et cetera. And these are going to continue, even though the GBD does, data say that communicable diseases in general are causing fewer deaths, uh, uh, there are these threats and pandemics. And then we have tremendous new resources for global health, uh, funding from uh, groups like the, the federal government foundations and other regions. And then yeah, there is this feeling of young people like many of you that the infant faith based organizations that really is the right thing to do. And by working in this way, we can really have an impact. So the students and their interest is amazing. So our department was launched in uh, uh, January of. 2007, after a 10-year strategic planning, ultimately the Gates Foundation produced funding for us, and we began. And uh, it's a unique department because it's in both the School of Medicine and the School of Public Health, so I have the privilege of reporting to two deans almost every day. Uh, and we have lots of global partners. And Mark Emmert, the president then, said he expected us to try to engage people in our department from across the university. There are 16 schools here. Uh, we have uh, faculty from 13 of the schools and from 38 departments, including orthopedics, and we continue to, to grow in that sense. Uh, this is our website. If you've never looked at it, it's the best website at the university. We just had uh, this conference uh, um, that was put together by students, bringing together students from uh, all across the West Coast. We had about six, 600 students who came, and it was on the topic of uh, being uncensored around uh, equity and uh, not only in health, but in uh, all things. So when we started, we were in this building. Up on the top floor, we had uh, four offices, and then we had five staff and three faculty, and we weren't able to put tuition for what we were doing teaching. And uh, it has evolved. We were able to get from the Gates Foundation a $10 million gift. One of the candidates for the job was now president of the World Bank, Jim Kim, said that's not enough, we need more. And I'm always grateful to him for getting more than $20 million as an endowment from the Gates Foundation. And the UW and the state of Washington, uh, uh, through the UW, has committed $2 million a year operating funds for us. Uh, and it rolled in over four years and now it continues. So we are reasonably well funded, even though we're brand new. And uh, our current budget is about $120 million per year in grants and contracts, uh, plus this. So it's, it's gotten to be the second largest department in terms of funding. Uh, we have, uh, as a department, 450 projects in uh, 111 countries. We're not actually trying to paint the world with husky purple colors. We're just going to crack it and we'll put that slide together. Um, so how is the department actually, actually making a difference? Like, what are we doing to contribute to making the world a healthier place? And this is about students. And we have uh, been steadily growing. We started in 07, quickly jumped to about 300 students, and then have been steadily 
increasing uh, as of now are over 500 students. And these students are in a variety of programs. And uh, we have uh, two PhD programs, one pathobiology and one with uh, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation and the Department of uh, Global Health Metrics and Implementation Science. We have several fellowships, and I'm going to tell you about one of them because it is relevant to the uh, uh, fellows we have, you have here, your, your residents, how they may be able to access some of this if they're interested in international uh, activities. We have six tracks in the Masters of Public Health program. For people enrolled in other uh, graduate programs, they can get a graduate certificate in global health and have a number of students in that. Medical school, now it's one of the largest pathways for the med students. Uh, we're 116, and it's rapidly growing as an undergraduate minor for people who have a major in some other field. So uh, in terms of uh, uh, what we're doing for residents, house staff, uh, Perry Farquhar has worked with a number of departments uh, to develop, first of all, a, a course to prepare people for global health, dealing with global health knowledge, leadership skills, and clinical rotations. And then uh, it's designed to strengthen the global health pathways that many of the departments have, medicine, pediatrics, OBGYN, family medicine, psychiatry. We've had discussions with orthopedics, uh, beginning uh, discussions on international rotations for them. We have uh, international sites for global health uh, placements for house staff and fellows uh, that are always quite busy. And uh, the departments listed here are all sharing the cost with us of those international rotations, which we could talk more about if you're interested. Uh, this one of the fellowship I wanted to mention uh, is called the Global Health Fellows Consortium, funded by NIH. And uh, these are the sites where we have programs. And the way this works is if somebody's coming off of a training program uh, at the UW and interested in spending a year, conceivably two years internationally, we have uh, fellowship funding from NIH currently to allow that person to move from their current fellowship into an international rotation. If you're interested in that, uh, the person I talk to is named Joe Zunt, or me, in the Department of Global Health. So our faculty, uh, uh, including primary and joint appointments, uh, these are regular appointments, plus adjunct, either from other departments or affiliate faculty from other agencies like the Institute from the Gates Foundation. Uh, they have faculty from, from uh, these UW schools. Uh, and last year we had 30 new faculty, here they are shown. There's an adjunct professor, there's acting professor positions. Uh, K.O. who will be speaking next, uh, joined our faculty uh, last year. We're delighted to have him here. And uh, some of the things that have been accomplished, uh, I mean it's amazing how much comes out of these people every year, but just the last two years, um, <coughs> There was this uh, uh, study that was published in the New England Journal about how uh, giving antiretroviral prophylaxis reduced the acquisition, risk of acquisition from a, a seropositive, HIV seropositive partner by 72 uh, percent, and for those who took the medications, by 92 percent. And as a result of that study, the Food and Drug Administration approved this uh, so-called pre-exposure prophylaxis program which is growing widely as an alternative to starting the seropositive partner on antiretroviral therapy early. Uh, <coughs> the, there were uh, papers that were prominent <coughs> that came out on hormonal contraception uh, showing that uh, women who were in these HIV serodiscordant couples taking uh, uh, injectable hormonal contraceptives if their partner was infected and they were HIV negative, they were twice as likely to acquire HIV. And if they were the HIV positive one and their partner was HIV negative, those getting depo provera were twice as likely to transmit the HIV to a seronegative partner. <coughs> so that was uh, obviously radically uh, upsetting for the hormone contraceptive field. And now there are uh, further studies on that. Um, <coughs> The Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, which currently has uh, quite a few faculty in our department, about uh, 20 now, uh, published this uh, you know, 
landmark study called the Global Burden of Disease Study. And Kay, I will talk to you more about that, so I won't. And then uh, uh, The Lancet uh, also published uh, the Global Health 2035 study, a World Convergent Within a Generation, led by Dean Jameson and Larry Summers. Uh, uh, and it really talks about how we will, what we need to do to move towards controlling infectious child and maternal mortality and the non communicable diseases and injuries that many of you are interested in. So this was a really a big uh, publication last year. So um, I looked, I did a, a brief literature review preparing for this talk on uh, what is the current status of global health for orthopedics and surgery in general. And pulled together a number of articles, and, and uh, Courtney will have these slides for those of you who are interested in pursuing this further. But uh, there were only uh, there were 81 publications uh, on this topic. And here they are. A paper by Clement, What is the Current Status of Global Health Activities and Opportunities in U.S. Orthopedic Residency Programs? One of the most recent. Uh, Global Health and General Surgery, a national survey of what people are doing, what residents want. Very large proportions of people in, in surgery and in orthopedics who are applying for uh, residencies <coughs> and are, are choosing on the basis of having these opportunities for international activities. And these articles detail that. Surgical residency uh, and training of international volunteerism. A national survey of residents from two surgical specialties, which were orthopedics and general surgery. And then uh, the UCSF International Orthopedic Elective. These are all described here. And uh, I wanted to, let's see, go back. Uh, and say that uh, uh, in these articles, um, they talked about the transition uh, from what is very common in orthopedics today, which is international volunteerism or missions, uh, which many of our faculty here have done a lot in, towards international partnerships that establish permanent training and research programs of international partners. And I think the people who have been engaged in the international volunteerism or missionary work are the best prepared to help us transition into these long-term partnerships that will grow the fields internationally far beyond what we can do indi individually in orthopedics. I went to a, a meeting on uh, that our anesthesiology department developed recently on uh, global health and anesthesiology. And I quoted a paper that had just been published in the Lancet by a group from Canada and the Netherlands, I think, and it was the UK, uh, on this whole theme of the transition from volunteerism to forming long-term partnerships. And I called it the best paper I'd seen in this particular area of anesthesia. And it turned out the author of that paper was in the audience and was happy and excited. And I would love to be able to do the same thing on the, in the orthopedics area as we see our partnerships grow uh, and as we try to help them out. Regard. So in that, with that, I will close with this. I think it's my last slide, which was a quote from the uh, paper, the column paper, that said, uh, um, <coughs> let's see, I'm going to get one more. Um, this quote was that a new day may be dawning in which the academic global surgeon is recognized as a unique and valuable professional alongside his colleagues in academic global surgery who are not involved in global health or more traditional academic tracks. And this is especially so with the popularization and awareness of global operative initiatives by surgeons such as Atul Malani and Harvey Cross, who in general was here. So on that, I will end and turn this over to Taylor.
going to talk to you about uh, the global burden of the disease, and I'll uh, answer a few of the questions that, uh, that were posed. Um, but I'll be very light on the methods, but I'll uh, spend most of my time showing you the results and the wonderful graphics that we have to uh, summarize and tons of information that we've got So the global burden of disease, uh, we call it a systematic scientific effort to quantify the comparative magnitude of health loss due to diseases, injuries, and risk factors. And all of that an enormous amount of detail by age, by sex, by countries, specific points in time. It started some 20 years ago uh, as an initiative by the World Bank and Harvard University and the World Health Organization. Uh, but since 1990, uh, since 2007, it's uh, been funded uh, by the Gates Foundation and it's up here at uh, UW. What we do is systematically reviewing everything we know about death and about prevalence. And we do this for currently 291 diseases and injuries, 67 risk factors, and we make results for 187. I should have crossed that. It's 188 now. South Sudan has, uh, has joined uh, the list. Uh, and in our current update, which is due to appear in a couple of months, uh, we're also including some subnationals, so including ADS estimates also by all the Chinese provinces. And we make explicit estimates for 1990 every five years until the most current year. And so we're currently working on 2013 results that will come out in a couple of months. But every year we're going to be updating all the information. There is currently a list of more than a thousand experts across the world who are actively uh, contributing uh, to this uh, effort. So, apart from making the best possible estimate of how many people die from what condition, how many people suffer from which diseases and injuries or the consequences thereof, we try and pull all of that together in a unique metric so that we can make comparisons. How big is back pain compared to uh, major depression compared to HIV? Very different diseases, very different uh, consequences. And so we use a metric that's called the disability adjusted life here, and it's the addition of a mortality component and a morbidity component. So for every death from a particular cause at a particular age, we make an estimate of how many years are lost because that person died at that particular age. We have a standard life expectancy of the years because we want to treat a death in Sierra Leone at a certain age, similar to a death at that same age in the US, regardless of what the local life expectancy is. For the non-fatal conditions and for you know, the area of your interest in musculoskeletal disease, most uh, conditions are uh, considered non-fatal conditions. We look at how many people suffer from the condition and how severe the consequences of that disease or injury are relative to all sorts of other consequences of disease. We call those disability rates. And just to clarify that when we talk about disability, we talk about any departure from good health. So a couple of days with a common cold will give you a tiny bit of disability. So it's not the definition that, uh, that uh, for instance, people uh, who uh, give our pensions for people with disabilities will have, which is more of a long-term chronic definition. These are the disability weights and the blue bars. I'll describe this uh, right now. <laughs> um, and the blue bars indicate uh, the uh, frequency of conditions that have uh, a disability weight in that range. So disability weight of zero means perfect health. A disability weight of one would be perfect ill health. 
and we see it ranges, most conditions are relatively mild, like mild anemia, uh, or mild arthritis, but the severest uh, condition that we have is active psychosis uh, due to schizophrenia, closely followed by polyplegia. So just to finish up these slides with what our view is of the role of the gold burning disease, we, we consider this a global public good, and therefore we spend a lot of time uh, showing the information to people who potentially can benefit from it. So we're going to update it on all these major diseases and risk factors annually. We make sure that we have comparable measurements and measurements that are not influenced by advocacy like so many health statistics are. Um, whenever I open up a newspaper that says there's a story about a particular disease, there's always a quote about how many people suffer from that disease. Invariably, those quotes are two to three times off from what we did to them. We have a big habit of, of over-counting and inflating numbers when people have a specific uh, disease set focus. Um, the, our big aim is to provide this information to policymakers and to health funders to help them set priorities and also importantly to track performance of past their policies. To further help that for next year, we're not just going to include the estimates and deaths and on numbers of cases, but we're also going to try to estimate how much is spent on each disease. Uh, and people have to start rather modestly with the number of countries where we can use well. Uh, but the aim is that over time we're going to track that expenditure by disease. So, let me show you some of our magic. So this is our, our tool of making estimates for non-fatal conditions. This is uh, the data that we have from back pain from the United States uh, from 1990 to 2013. Every little gray bar is a data point. The bar plus indicates the age range and the line the vertical line indicates the uncertainty in each of the data points. And you can see, even in the US, there's a massive amount of variation in how the data comes to us on back pain. So we have to make some sense out of this. And the first thing we do is we look at how have these uh, data points been collected? What were the definitions? What were the methods? Are they comparable? And if they are not comparable, how can we make them comparable? So just to illustrate this, from the raw data that you see here, we adjust the data by known relationships or relationships that we observe in the data by how different methods of asking questions and establishing back pain uh, relate to each other so that we can make these estimates more comparable. And this is a big problem in making these non-fatal estimates. People do studies in lots of different ways, use different methods, and uh, you get very different estimates just looking at the raw data. But what we are after is not the variations in how people measure the occurrence of the disease. What we are after is what is the true variation, or what is the common uh, theme within all the data. So what you then see is Eventually, we come up with these blue lines, and the area around it indicates how much uncertainty we estimate there is in this age pattern of the occurrence of that factor. We also see that there are many time periods where we have lots of data, but there's also for 90, the 1990 period, we didn't have a single data point that we could find in the US. So the tool helps us to infer what the level of back pain likely was in 1990, given everything that we know about uh, the years uh, following. 
interesting feature here is also that if you hover over any data point, it gives you the metadata. It tells you the reference where it came from, and it tells you what the amount of adjustment is that we made uh, to the data point. Then we can map this. This is uh, low back pain again in 2010, and uh, it shows the variation across uh, the globe. But if you're interested in the provinces of China, here we are. And look at the variation. And you can then look at what it is for males. So this is a wonderful tool. Or not only for us, because we use this a lot for diagnostics, to <coughs> pick up you know, where there may be problems in the data where we need to make the adjustments, but also for policymakers to see what the distribution is of a particular disease. Going on to the big picture. This is what we call a tree map. It's like a square uh, a pie chart. All the boxes add up to 100%. And what I'm showing you now is the contribution of these years of bypass, so our translation of deaths in the world. And you almost need a magnifying glass to find musculoskeletal disease. Very small contribution to mortality in the world. But if I now move on to disability, the musculoskeletal conditions are a big chunk of the overall pie of, uh, of disability. Only trumped by a few percentage points by combined say on the way mental and substance use disorders. So the importance of making measurements in disability adjusted life years is if you move away from the traditional priority lists that are totally based on what makes people die and puts into the picture these major sources of disability. We can then look at what it is among the whole picture. Of course, mortality globally is still a very important part of all the, the deaths from diarrhea, pneumonia, and the labor conditions, HIV, TB, malaria. But if we go to the United States, we can see that as a proportion of the total burden, those clinical conditions are highly large. We can also look at greater detail. So among the musculoskeletal conditions, go back and your neck pain, very important contributors, osteoarthritis, a bit smaller for rheumatoid arthritis, Tiny little thing here for gout, and then a rest category for other musculoskeletal conditions. In next iterations of the global burden, we're going to try and unpack this rather large category of other musculoskeletal uh, disorders. For instance, we're going to uh, break out estimates, separate estimates for shoulder. Also, if you look at the distribution of disability by age across the globe, you can see this very large contribution in dealing with mental and substance use disorders. But here in this mobish color, uh, the musculoskeletal uh, disorders. You can see it's a very large contributor across the age range from age five onwards, but particularly in young and younger adults. And that contrasts with a totally different picture if you just look at the mortality component in years of life loss. Um, and we can look again, if you like, at this in the United States. So this picture of the mortality component, then looking at the disability uh, part uh, of it, and then we can also look at the combination of the two and see the contribution of musculoskeletal disorders 
as part of the overall burden of disease. We can switch to just looking at musculoskeletal disorders. Again, a very large contribution of that in the case, across the age range. Much more component of rheumatoid arthritis, a reasonable component of osteoarthritis, and then this largest breast category on top. All these uh, visuals are available on our website. And our stats uh, indicate that uh, people who go to the website get hooked rather quickly. But more than 30 minutes are uh, average time that people spend on our website, which is uh, quite remarkable. Let me see if I can make this. It is are for the 20, 1990 and 2010 estimates for all the disability in the world, the top conditions. You can see low back pain, consistently the highest back pain contributor, neck pain, very high up, other musculoskeletal, and osteoarthritis. So four major musculoskeletal uh, conditions in the top well, in the 2010 and top 11 uh, of major contributors as to disability. And then you can include falls with some of its uh, consequences uh, in that uh, as well. And those will be. Lastly, maybe to show you Uh, another take at uh, the data. This is where, instead of measuring individual diseases and injuries, we look at major risk factors and uh, what contribution these risk factors make. Risk factors make to all these uh, diseases. Now, for musculoskeletal disorders, we don't have too many risk factors uh, known, bigger risk factors that explain. The ones that we have, and this is again the global picture are high body mass index, so obesity, um, that is the attribution of uh, obesity to osteoarthritis and a little bit of, uh, of back pain. And then again in this very dark blue, a large contribution of low back pain to the burden from occupational exposures and hazards. I think for people in the occupational field, uh, this was a bit of an eye opener. So it seems to be uh, really excited uh, about vaccinogens uh, and uh, uh, maybe particulates and for occupational injuries, but that's not considered that in terms of size of the group, uh, low back pain may be uh, the largest. So just a, a quick overview of this uh, study. Lots, lots of more information available. And if you Google global form of disease, it's inevitable that you'll find our website with all these visualizations. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Holmes and Dr. Voss for coming, and uh, it's really a very special um, event to have this, and uh, I think these names are what we were missing. We didn't really understand what they were trying to say, and for all those who are interested in looking at orthopedics, I think in a bigger way, they're going to need to learn these names. So I just want to tell my story a little bit. My story for orthopedics really started with my dad who worked with the uh, ship Hope in the last trip to Brazil. And these are some of the places that I went and I've worked over the years. And I will uh, try to go through it. This is me, 48 years ago, coming out of Syria and uh, working on a thalassemia project in the Middle East. And it was under tropical medicine at that time. And uh, so I've, I've had a lot of, a lot of road Right, it's the same guy. And uh, so third world missions, I just want to make sure that, that 
there's a lot of people in our department who've done a lot of things. And I want to, this was a list that I could remember and give some credit to because uh, I knew that they had made these trips. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit about how I started when I did my, I left here, I uh, left the residency and went to Hong Kong. And when I got there, this was about the second day I was there, and this woman was in front of me. And she was a walking around woman. She was a 58 year old, I think. And she had this draining sinus on her back. So I had been trained that she should inject that with some methylene blue, and you could find out where the osteomyelitis was, and then we could cure it. And that's what we did during my residency. So I put in a catheter. And I put a little barium in it so I could see where the dye might go. And then suddenly there was a violent cough. And this is what she looked like. I had done a complete bronchogram. You can see all the way up into the trachea. You can see all the way down the retroperitoneal space. And you can see where it surrounded the kidney. And so in one second, I learned a lot about tuberculosis and where it goes. And this was a case that uh, stuck with me all these years. And it's a dramatic case of, of the whole disease in one quick look. And this is another step where you, where you look at a plain x-ray and then you say, well, maybe I need to know more about soft tissue. Uh, well, on the left, you can see a fusiform uh, shadow, and then you can see one disc space that disappears. The next day when I saw her, she had drained into her pleura, and this was now tuberculosis that extended from the spine into, the, uh, into her lung. So as early as 1779, Potts described this uh, condition, and it is around the world. So I thought that I might share these two little cases. This is a case in which the tuberculosis is in the neck. How did the surgeons learn how to get to this area? Well, they went back, and this is scrofulous. And if you look up on the neck there, where the bandage has been removed, there's an area which is drained. So tuberculosis really taught us how to get to the anatomical sites. And so it's one of the great teachers of uh, orthopedics, especially for spine surgery. So, Tell me, uh, talk a little bit about tuberculosis. There's 9.6 million worldwide developed TB per year. 10,000 cases in the United States. 1.3 million worldwide die. 320 among the HIV population. What's even more concerning is that the resistant tuberculosis, resistant diagnosis and other things, that 3.6 of the new cases in 2012 and 20% of people who had previously been infected with tuberculosis. So this brought up what has really gone on and has there been any success? This is a great success story because the World Health uh, Association had been involved with this and in 1990 they wrote a plan for a Millennium Development Goal to reduce 50% of the tuberculosis incidence by 2015. And that progress has progressed. We are now down about 2% per year. It costs about $8 billion a year. And we are now at uh, 80, we're now down to um, approximately 60%, as I remember of the new cases. So some of this has been because we have this rapid molecular diagnostic test and, uh, and we are able to make the diagnosis, be suspicious of it, be educated and treating it. So there is real progress in these uh, diseases. And uh, these were the questions that were asked and I'm going to try to answer a few of those that might relate to our department and to our residency. I think one of the first things to learn is that we had to get some sort of code of musculoskeletal disease that would be accepted internationally. And of course, it's got to talk about the etiology, it's got to talk about the exact anatomy. And last week, Brad Henley gave us a real report on what it's going to do with the ICD-10. And we realized that in 1995, Britain had already accepted the ICD-10. Turns out that they don't have to add all the data that we are being asked to do. But 
at least there's a system, and that's going to be a very important thing to report to a global health group, really those numbers and statistics. Next thing I want to talk about is telemedicine, and which really means distant medicine. And this word tele keeps coming up in our, uh, in our history. But 150 years ago, the fastest message was the speed of a horse. And 120 years ago, telegraphy began by wire. 100 years ago, the telephone. 60 years ago, television. And in 1964, there was actually a closed circuit television between a psychiatric, psychiatric institution in Omaha and in Norfolk, 112 miles. And over this 50 years, we have been very slow to adapt uh, really telemedicine in its form. So we had a very exciting uh, time here because if you look at what the World Health Organization wants to do, they really are a great proponent and recognize that the provider and recipient must be present in the same place and in time. And that's what's going to make a difference. This is not a delayed thing. This is a in front of you type of uh, consultation. And Europe has really accepted it, and Britain has now made it the heart of the strategy to modernize and improve their National Health Institute, their system. And uh, WHO uh, constantly says telemedicine is not a new technology, not a new branch of medicine. It's just a tool in which better medicine can be given. So I wanted to share with you, uh, March 4th of this year, I was in, uh, we were on our way to uh, Indonesia and we set up a conference and the conference was between, <coughs> was between Jakarta and the University of Washington. So at 10 o'clock at night we met 15 hours ahead of here and with this uh, Aaron Schoens who's here was the person who really set this up through, uh, through uh, uh, the University of Washington there. So Polycom system was used. And I just want to show you what that, um, what that is. Let's see, Aaron? It was? I promise it works. All right. Well, this is a young girl that's being presented. She's a seven-year-old girl, and I think that her findings are pretty obvious. So we have about uh, 30 uh, residents at 10 o'clock at night, and a, uh, a full faculty. So this is a girl with a very, very severe deformity of her thoracic spine. And to tell a little more about it, she is a girl with a, who has a radial hand on her right side. She had a coarctation of aorta, which was closed at, uh, at one month in Singapore. And she has a, uh, a congenital spine, and she has a hypoplastic lung. But otherwise, she's quite active. She climbs multiple steps without a problem, and she's quite good. So with this system, we were able to use a camera that will swing. And these are really stand-up old x-rays that are on a board and can be, uh, and can be uh, projected and brought here. So this is a picture of her from the side with this diagnosis. This is the terrible uh, scoliosis that exists at that level. This is her x-ray, and you can see the congenital uh, vertebra at T10. So this is a discussion now occurring at the University of Washington. This is Mike Lee speaking here with Dr. Lozier and the others. I want to say there was no voice delay that was detectable. The quality of this was perfect, and the band is the, the, the width of the band that we had to use was established in the two places, and it worked very, very well. My own personal thought is that this is the heavy vertebra that exists as a small posterior uh, in the 
So the discussion here was whether you would try to uh, use growing rods of this young girl or whether you would resect the entire uh, heavy vertebra. And, uh, and the discussion was really quite lively and it went back and forth between two places. I think this girl got a really excellent consultation. Consultation could be shared with the parents and with an entire residency program in Indonesia. They have 80 residents and, uh, and I think that we can really begin to use this. And I'm, uh, this is the entire collection there that is present. And uh, we felt very good. The chair colors were very excellent because they had the University of Washington colors and uh, we thought that was a great coincidence and a good omen. So I'm going to go, um, so one of the things I think that we have to learn is who owns muscular skeletal disease? And I think the orthopedists are distorted and I think the world doesn't understand where we sit in this. Because if you have cerebral palsy, are you a neurology patient? If you have a sore hip, are you really a rheumatology patient? And when you collect world data, where does this go? If you have a spinal cord injury with a spinal cord uh, operation, is that a neurosurgery case? And I think that as we work out with Dr. Voss and with others, how we're going to put orthopedics in this formula is really important. And the more I learn about what each side doesn't understand, it becomes painfully clear to me that we need to take a big spot because if we're going to improve a dolly, we have a lot to do with it. And if you replace the hip, the patient goes back to work and becomes productive. So I think we have a huge part in, the, uh, in this formula. And the uh, first study that I know of with a burden of disease was really with World Health. And remember, this population has now gone from, uh, we're now 7.1 billion people in the world. And uh, that number keeps escaping us, and uh, really. But remember overall, vascular ischemic heart and limb disease is a greater global burden. And depression and mental disease sits up at number two. And only recently has road accidents risen to number three. And that's what is bringing orthopedics into a formula that World Health can recognize. And uh, I think that's pretty important. And uh, this is really what's happening around the world. If you have, uh, you know, millions of motorcycles, millions of bicycles, and then you introduce a much faster moving vehicle, something's going to give. And people are really injured. And here's a young man who loses both legs. I happen to know the story about this. And this legs, he did not need to lose his legs. This was a very delayed treatment in a very small hospital and got infected and this is what he ends up with. So when I look at this, is this a, a permanent dolly for his whole life or can you get a prosthesis and get him back to work and reduce his dollies? I'm not sure the answer to that. I'm not sure how you get the data that Dr. Voss needs for his studies. This is neurofibromatosis, untreated, and uh, with a severe, severe deformity, and with now a progressive neurologic lesion. Where does that fit? So I just want to think briefly about Bangladesh, because I think everything that, everything that uh, is exaggerated is, is true in Bangladesh. Bangladesh is really a delta. It's like Louisiana. It's got two of the biggest rivers in the world, comes together. And it really has no land that's more than about 10 feet above water. It's losing about a third of its land every uh, monsoon period. It is a, and it's going to lose half of all of its country in, uh, in about 20 years on the predicted uh, charts. So this is what it looks like during the monsoons. This is, uh, uh, and this is the size, the size of Kansas, population of 166 million people, the eighth largest country. It's full of traffic like this, and uh, it's rickshaws and motorcycles and scooters, and, and you're trying to move those people around. As soon as you go in the country, this is what it's like. There is no distance between dry land and water, 
and it has all the problems. So really clean water is a problem. And I only bring these up because they're, they're above, and above orthopedics. There's 780 million people in the world who lack access to safe water. 345 million of those people live in Africa. And every 21 seconds a child dies from water-related uh, disease. And most things that women around the world spend 200 million hours a day collecting water. That is an inefficient problem. And we need to uh, deal with that. And then 3.4 million people die, and it's mainly due to the developing countries and poverty. And in these trauma centers, this is a thousand bed trauma center in uh, Bangladesh. These are the cases that came there right in front of me when they were there. This is a never treated hip fracture. It has actually gone on to union. And 10.4 million children die a year. Most of these deaths come from low income. So how much money do they have in Bangladesh to spend? About $3.95 cents per capita. And so the minimal amount of money that the government can support the medicine is really harsh. So I only want to leave you with some great pride that I come from Seattle and that, uh, and that uh, Bill and Melinda Gates are here. But he really said, in an ethical way, is the rich world aware of how 4 billion or 6 billion live? This is written in 2007. If we were aware, we would want to help and we'd want to get involved. The second is, if you believe that every life is equal value, it's, revol it's revolting to learn that some lives are seen as worth savings and others are not. And finally, how would the world let these children die? The answer is simple and harsh. The market did not reward saving the lives of these children, and the governments did not subsidize it. So the children died because their mothers and their fathers had no power in the market and no voice in the system. These are powerful statements and uh, haunt me, certainly. Another way of looking at it ethically is if good is that which improves the community, evil is that which weakens the community, the wisdom is the ability to distinguish good from evil. Finally, these are my suggestions for the residency and the faculty, and that is that we need to arrange a supervised visit to an emerging country. I think that's really important. I think we need to share a research project with the University of Washington Global Health Department. I think we need to establish a foreign travel endowment. I think we need to establish a faculty resident network with the six training programs that already send residents to the third world. There are tricks and problems with sending residents to the world, and we need to learn how to do that. Remember, the orthopedic resident director knows the rules and he owns your electric time. So, uh, Dr. Howard, we, uh, we need you. Thank you. I'd like to ask if there's uh, any leading question that's left over because we're a little beyond our time. Anybody have any questions? If not, we'll conclude and again thank Dr. Holmes and Dr. Voss for coming. Thank you.